So hello, everybody. Welcome to our Governance Made Easy webinar titled today, How Late Reporting Kills the CEO. And this is in association with our good friends at Governance Institute Australia. My name's Sean McDonald, and I'll be your moderator for the next 45 odd minutes. Firstly, thanks for attending today. We really appreciate the effort you've made to be here for our live events. And during our session, if you do have any questions for Brett or the panel, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we'll be answering as many of these as we have time for. And finally, if you stay through till the end of the webinar, which we hope you will do, and as is customary for our webinars, we have a special treat for you. By answering a really short one-minute survey, at the end of the webinar, you'll go into the draw to win our beautiful gift hamper worth over $400. Now, for those that don't know much about BoardPro, simply we're a board software provider that serve around 20,000 users around the world. And we, we enable organizations to prepare for and run their board meetings more efficiently and effectively with, you guessed it, clever software, with less time and deliver more impact and value for the organization. And as much as we are a board software provider or sometimes called a board portal, Part of our wider mission is to make the fundamentals of governance free and easy to implement for all organizations, especially those with resource constraints. Now, it's really time just to sort of sit back and relax. Uh, we will be sending you a copy of the slide deck presentation, the, uh, the guide that you see here on the right-hand side, sorry, the white paper from Stephen, How Late Reporting Kills the CEO and you'll have a copy of the presentation, the video as well. So uh, we'd love to see some questions coming from you. We also have a special bonus for today. At the end of the webinar, we will send out our popular CEO report template and guide. This template incidentally has been rated number one on Google for the last three years, I think, Brett. Yep. So, uh, when you receive it, feel free to edit the document as you see fit for your organization. So let me start by introducing our guest and panelist, Megan Motto, our guest for this afternoon is Chief Executive Officer of Governance Institute Australia, a national membership association and leading authority on governance. Megan drives the direction of the Institute that advocates for 40,000 governance and risk management professionals from the listed, unlisted and not-for-profit sectors. Prior to her Governance Institute role, Megan was CEO of Consult Australia. Megan is also currently a Director of Standards Australia, National Director for the Committee of Economic Development of Australia, or CEDA. And Megan has a BA, BD, and MA in Communications Management, and is a Fellow of both Governance Institute Australia and Australian Institute of Company Directors. Welcome to you, Megan. Stephen Bowman is, of course, Managing Director of Conscious Governance and brings a great depth of experience with board reviews and strategic planning. Stephen has a, a huge wealth of executive and governance experience and has written over 14 books on governance and strategy. Kia ora to you, Stephen. Hello, everyone from around the world. Brett Hurt is, of course, the co-founder and CEO here at BoardPro. Brett is a serial entrepreneur, having built several high-growth businesses over the last 20 years, and he brings tenacity, a strategic mindset, and strong generalist business skills, and an enduring curiosity to the table. Brett is also the author of our top-rated template, the CEO report template that you'll be receiving today that I spoke of a little bit earlier. So welcome to you, Brett. You're a co-to and welcome, everyone. So for now, let me hand over to you, Steve, uh, to start our webinar. Thanks very much, Sean. So um, just noting some of the questions people have already uh, put in the, in the chat there, um, one of the biggest things we find that with reporting that uh, a number of things are, have always been happening, but they seem to be getting you know, quicker and faster in terms of how they're occurring. One of them is we're finding still that there's lots of late reports going out. So you get your normal board pack, but then you get things two or three days beforehand. And uh, sometimes that becomes the, uh, the rule rather than the exception. The other thing is that um, lots of boards are spending way too much time um, going over incredibly voluminous reports as well too. 
And they're finding that they're getting very frustrated because all they know, often all they know is I need more information because I'm not getting what I need. So what we want to do today is just, just to have a look at this whole notion of late reporting and really look at it from two perspectives. The first one is um, late reporting that is annoying. Late reporting that is annoying is board papers that go out a day before the board meeting, is uh, board papers where you get the board pack, but then there's half a dozen other papers because people didn't have time to either send them out or the information coming to them was too late. So that's the first type. The second type is what I've called existential. These can ruin an organisation. These can really put you at risk. And this is where the reporting to the board is way too late in terms of trends and things that are happening out in the environment. So these reports often are about the activities we're currently doing, but there's no looking at what might be in three years or five years. And the way our board meetings are structured um, don't necessarily support having a uh, an ongoing view of what's happening out in the environment and what are the emerging issues, the emerging risks that are appearing now. And that's existential because your organisation can cease to exist if you don't actually keep yourself up to date with what might be into the future. Megan, thoughts? I uh, couldn't agree with you more. And um, I, gosh, the opening statement there is, is so wide and, and varied. Uh, and, and I think that... Um, yeah, I always look through the lens of annoying reporting and we'll get into the detail of what you do about this and some really practical examples and some really mm. practical takeaways. But the the whole world these days and the business community and the not-for-profit community, we're all heading down this pathway of understanding that we have to deliver customer centricity. We have to think about, about who our customer is and not tell them what products we want to produce for them, but ask them what products they want. And reporting to your board is no different. So your executives are not producing papers for themselves. They are not producing papers for a management meeting. They are producing papers for a customer that is a director. And so thinking through that lens is first and foremost. I used to be a, an English teacher. And uh, when I talk about when we write any document, the first thing that we have to ask is, who is the audience for this document? Is it a policy wonk in Canberra that wants to read the detail of a policy submission, in which case you use very formal language and very detailed examples? Or is it, you know, a marketing, a piece of marketing for social media, in, in which case you want it to be short, snappy, emotional, et cetera? Your board is another audience and you've got to think about your audience first and foremost. Great. I'm really intrigued, Stephen, with this idea of the uh, late reporting in terms of being late to actually report the things that are important. Mm. When we did validation years ago, the you know it, it was obvious we got lots of feedback. The directors, board members, get really frustrated by getting it a day before one of your scenarios. Mm. But I think it's a a more hidden killer where. The executive is just not on the game with the chair to, to pick the really important things and get them, you know, front of mind. And, and if you can deal with those early, I think it helps both the organisation and it helps the CEO stay alive. Yeah, and one of the... Sorry, Megan, over to you. Jumping in there, a really practical example and something that I do here at the Governance Institute um, oftentimes executives sit and think about strategy and we've got a, you know, we're in the business day to day. We, we have a bit of a heads up on where we think some pieces of strategy might be going, some of the things, but we might not be quite ready for that report to go into this board pack yet because we either haven't done our investigations, we don't have our thought processes well fleshed out, whatnot. But one of the things that I often do is tell boards, um, and you can just do it as a, a bit of a list at the end of your actions arising or your CEO report, you know, what are some reports that you intend to be putting in future board packs? So I might say, look, the December meeting is next and I'm intending, it didn't come to this board pack, but in the December board meeting, one of the things that I'm thinking about is our membership model or whatever it might be, and I'm going to have a paper coming to you about the membership model. Um, I do that for a couple of reasons. First of all, boards hate surprises. So not surprising them with a with a paper that they didn't know anything about is really important. The second is, of course, this idea of the early thinking and bringing boards on a journey. Remember that directors, they're not in your business day to day. They drop in and out, you know, whether it's 
three times a year, five times a year, six times a year, 12 times a year, but they're not in the business day to day. So I always treat it a little bit like a debating speech. In a speech, you've got to tell people what you're about to tell them and then you tell it to them and then you tell them, tell them in a conclusion what you just told them. So you kind of got to remind people three times about the subject matter because that's what it takes to have things sink in. So I think that that's a really important thing to keep in mind and letting boards know that you're thinking ahead and you might not be ready with the paper right yet, but getting the board to start thinking ahead about, oh, what is wrong with our membership model? What, what are I doing their own investigation so that they're coming prepared to read that paper when it comes and yeah, coming I've, together with their own thought processes? I've seen a, a, a number of CEO reports in the last 12 months where what they've done is they've taken the first page of their CEO report and they give a, a very simple dashboard of the, of the health of the various operational side of things with supporting papers if you need them further down under um, papers for noting. But the, the, the section that most directors tend to read are the emerging issues and emerging papers section. So emerging issues, we don't want you to be worried about it yet, but it is an emerging issue and wait for more information from us so, to help lead you through the thinking that we, we want support with on this. And then the emerging papers gives you a, a bit of a head, heads up of um, you know, the big meaty topics that are coming up, for example, um, you know, artificial intelligence, if you're starting to do a paper on what we're doing within the organisation to start dealing with artificial intelligence and how we'd like the board involved and the guidance that we'd like to seek from the board on that sort of stuff, that's a heads up. <clears throat> the nice thing about that is that directors that are really interested are going to start reading up themselves and get themselves a little bit ready prior to even putting the paper forward. So. Um, yeah, so emerging issues and emerging papers, I think, is just a very simple, you know, like little dot points without a whole lot of uh, detail underneath them. So good good ideas, Megan. Okay, Sean, you want to move on? So <clears throat> go to the next one. Um, one of the things that we want to be able to do is to both, the purpose of reports is not to make sure staff are busy. The purpose of reports is to put stuff in a logical manner that keeps us as a board focused on the things that we need to be focused on. So if you go back to basics and look at, you know, what is the role of a board? One of the things that we talk about is uh, the role of any board is to make the choices that create the future for the communities that we serve. And we do that through strategy and risk and finance and leadership and culture. So they're all the tools. But our real job as a board is to make choices, to make the choices that actually create the future for the communities that we serve. And so, therefore, any board paper coming up to the board has to be very clear about what are our choices? <laughs> what are they? Here's option one. Here's option two. Here's option three. These are the, the, the business cases behind each of them. We can make any of them work. Um, here are some of the questions you might want to consider, but here are the choices that we've got. Let's have a talk about that and let's crunch that. And then those choices have to create the future. So we need to align them with strategy. We need to align them with our risk appetite. We need to align them with the emerging risks that are coming through, with our vision statement. Um, none of it's difficult to do, but it just has to be done. And then making the choices that create the future for the communities that we serve. So who are the communities that this is serving? What about the other communities? What about how do we know that that's going to be serving those communities? So these are the strategic conversations that should be had around any board paper. So the notion of um, providing board papers to the board is not to prove how busy we are, it's to keep them focused. And if you use the filter on any board paper coming up to the board is how is this helping the board to focus then you start to write, as Megan said before, you're starting to write for, the, write for the audience. The board need to remain focused on the big issues that is worthy of board time. My board paper has to help them do that before you send it off to the company secretary to put in the board packs. Megan? Oh, couldn't agree with you more. Um, it probably is going to be a theme. Uh, for this presentation. So one thing that I'd say is, I'll, I'll make three quick points. Um, the, third, the first point is around whether or not, and, and this is a conversation that the CEO really needs to have with the board and with the chair. Some boards will like papers that's, that give them the options, as you've described. You know, this is option one, this is option two, this is option three. Other boards will say, 
Give me, well, what's your, because I would be the director that would say, well, that's fine. There's three options. What's your recommendation? Which way yeah. you're in the business full time, you're in the business day to day, which option do you prefer and why? So if you're going to give options, you either need to upfront, and some boards want the recommendation upfront because they want to be led a little bit more and they, they, they know that management has a position and they'd like to hear it. Other boards would will like a little bit more control and a sense of control. So they'll say, well, I don't, I, I don't want your recommendation. You give me the options and we'll discuss the options. I, I think the former is much more effective. So I would suggest that you say, here are the three options. Our recommendation is you go with option A and here's why. So, so be very, very clear about that. Um, so this, the second thing, the point that I'd make, and, and I make this often, and I've actually been uh, you know, misquoting uh, until recently, and someone has um, very kindly corrected me. I always attribute the quote to, to Mark Quain, and, of course, he, he created a variation of it, but actually came from um, a French mathematician and philosopher in 1657 uh, named Blaise Pascal, and it's the whole concept of I would have written a shorter letter, but I didn't have the time. I didn't have time, so I wrote you a longer letter. One of the key things about these voluminous board reports is, quite frankly, they're lazy. They're lazy and they're misguided. Um, they're lazy because people, it, it takes a lot of time to really think and distill and focus. And quite frankly, I'm sorry, but the, my expectation is my executives will spend that time, that they will be considered, that they will be careful, that they will be um, both generous but also respectful of the board's time. So there's there's a piece there that is about just being lazy and chucking all the information in. And then there's a piece around they are worried that different directors want different levels of detail. And if you're going to have cognitive diversity on your board, that should absolutely be the case. You'll have some detail-oriented people that want all of the detail. They want to see the 57-page IT infrastructure report and then you'll have some that are big picture thinkers that say, well, I don't need to know how the 57 servers of the organisation are connected. I wouldn't understand it anyway. That's your job. I want the big picture. So it is a conversation that chief executives have to have. It takes a strong company secretary. It takes a strong chair to moderate that behaviour of the board because a lot of time one director will say, oh, well, I want more information. And the ratcheting up of the information flow then becomes the norm. So a good chair needs to pull that back. A good CEO needs to pull that back and say, well, I can provide all these voluminous reports, but that's going to mean your board packs 300 pages. So let's let's have a conversation about what you really want here. There's a couple of practical a couple of practical elements that one can take in there as well, too. So for those detailed orientated people. They, they should have the ability to have access to it, but I'd also suggest very strongly you don't put it in the board pack as right. such. But resor but using the resources centre wisely is a really use your resource centre, exactly, exactly, Megan, and, and and links to it rather than the whole paper. So if you get a large, uh, a large report, rather than just putting it in the board pack for everyone, put a link to it, but you have a one-page executive summary of the two things the board need to know about from that particular report. And so that um, the those who are detail oriented can, can get access to it. But psychologically, if you put a large report in the board pack, every director feels they have to read the darn thing. Well, from a fiduciary perspective, they do. They don't have to read the whole thing. They've got to understand what the key elements of it are. And so having that having access to it doesn't necessarily mean. So if you have a report that um, has. Uh, a lot of detail about some of the marketing they're doing, for example, the detail orientated people might want to get into that in detail. But as a director, I probably want to know what are the two key points and I can go and read the report to support those two key points if I need to. But if you put it in the board pack just as a 50 page document from a consultant, people feel as if they have to read it and they get lost in the weeds. Well, let me tell you, Stephen, if something goes wrong and you're called up in front of a Senate inquiry, an ASIC Royal Commission and you're asked, did you, did you spot that detail on page 44 and you go, no, because I didn't read the whole thing, you're in trouble as a director. So and even, even if you have... That yeah. directors will be across the detail of what is presented to them. That is the fiduciary duty that you have under the Corporations Act. Yeah, you, you, not disagreeing with you on that, Megan. At the same time, we need to know what are those key elements that are in there. Totally. So, 
So, yeah, the, the, one of the more famous cases is that uh, on a page, about page 43, the Centro case, for example, yeah. um, there were some elements in there that the directors missed. It was sort of, yeah, it was both mis misstated and also they missed it in there. And, and Justice Middleton actually said, look, um, the, th the key thing you didn't do was ask questions about some of that information. Um, so... In all of these board reports, wisdom in all of it, but make sure that if you're you're not just putting in um, voluminous reports from external parties without at least giving a summary right up front and then access to that paper if people would want to read the detail of that paper. So um, in all of this, when we're looking at board papers, uh, I, I think let's let's actually ask the, the the two key questions here. For board papers that come up late to the board, so that we've got our board pack, they've gone out, and then you're getting all these sort of late papers coming in as well too. What are the sorts of things that we can do to minimise the potential for late papers? And I'll kick this one off just by saying, look, sometimes... Um, you let board members know that the paper that they've got in front of them doesn't have all the detail at this stage, um, but you still send it out in the board pack. So the paper will come out saying, look, this is what we've got at the moment. As new information becomes available in the next few days, we'll provide that to you as well, rather than leaving everything until the day before the board meeting. Megan, what have you seen in this space? Yeah, a couple of things. I mean, some of it's because, it, you know, executives and, you know, you've obviously got a variety of people in your organisation that are creating inputs into these board reports, you know, manager, line managers putting things up to senior managers, putting things up to executives, then goes into a board paper. So sometimes the process can take time. But the discipline of senior executives is absolutely critical here um, on two, two counts. The first is the timeliness of the paper itself. And the second part is, of course, um, how voluminous the paper is. Simple rules. I told my executive when I started at the Governance Institute, every board paper needs to be three pages, including attachments. That's not that you can do a summary three pages and have a 47-page document sitting behind it. So every paper needs to be a three-page document. And if you want more than three pages, you have to actually come to me with a business case saying why you need more than three pages. Okay. So look, and, and literally cutting it off three pages and saying, if you don't cut it to three pages, I will cut. I will cut your paper arbitrarily and, you know, you don't get to make that call. Mm -hmm. So I think that it does take, you know, a strong stance at times. Same thing with late papers. Having the chairman come in and read the right book to the executive to say it is inconsiderate and disrespectful to give your papers late to your CEO and company secretary because they're the ones that are facing you know, the board, the Spanish Inquisition sitting in front of them, and they are the ones that are ultimately answerable for that occurring. So um, I think that that's also really clever. Just in terms of practicalities, couldn't agree with you more, Steve. Give them what you can when you can. If it's incomplete information, add the detail later. Also, you know, sometimes people really rush to get it into a board paper. Consider does it need to be in this board cycle? Can you have an extraordinary meeting if you don't have all the information at hand? Do you prep them up saying there's an issue that's brewing? I'm actually not going to have all the information for another two weeks. We're going to have to have it. We are going to have to fit in an extraordinary board meeting. Yep. Yeah. What have you found, Brad, in your in your journey through all this? Well, I just wanted to jump in. Um, Egan did it nicely at the very end there. I think there's um there's a case to be brave on occasion to say, look, the, the, the situation on the ground has changed or whatever interruption has come and I can't deliver. So the CEO has got to get on the phone to the chair um, and discuss, do, do we do it the cycle in between meeting, as, as Megan has said, because you're dealing with a finite period of time of board attention. You're better to delay things and get a good outcome than try and squeeze in six things. Two of them are rubbish. You just frustrate the board and, and it can overflow into the whole you know, the whole meeting and affect all of the decisions. Hmm. So the, the next thing I want to talk a little bit about is um, the more existential side of things, which is, are we reporting on the right sorts of things? Because reporting on activity is not really what we're there for. Reporting on uh, strategic implications and strategic issues and things that are worthy of board time is what we really should be focusing our time on as, as both uh, report writers but also as directors ourselves. So, Sean, can we go on to the next slide? So one of the things there is um, always looking at when we are doing a report, it's not just about 
lagging indicators. Here's the things that have been, but it's also getting the board to think, giving the board some prompts about some of the questions and some of the more forward-looking discussions that we need to have around this. And typically the worst reports I see, and I see thousands of them during the year, are the financial reports. The financial reports typically are technically correct in most instances and informationally somewhat useless. So what we need to be able to do is actually add more value to our reporting there so that some of these existential stuff don't, don't, don't come out of nowhere and surprise the board. So, for example, in the profit and loss statement, I still see many board papers where they provide them with a, a, a spat out version of QuickBooks or, or Myob. And if you're lucky, you might get some reasons for the variance. And then there might be commentary around those reasons for the variance. But there's very seldom. So what does it all mean to us? What do we need to start looking at? What is it? What are the implications of this? Is it, if it was to go on for another two years, what, what do we need to start thinking about? So one of the things we've found very useful is to have a heading either at the start of the report or at the end of the report, something like strategic implications for board discussion. Don't tell me what the variances are. Tell me what it means for us going forward for the next two or three years. What are some of the big picture things we need to look at? Balance sheet, for example, you know, ideally you get ratios from the balance sheet. Just don't don't tell me we've got a good ratio. Tell me what that might mean. What's the trend been? What are some of the big emerging issues coming that might have an effect on these ratios? Give me something that's worthy of my time talking about rather than just monitoring how things are. So a question for you, Stephen. Yeah, go for it, Brett. So on our CEO report. Excuse me. Sorry, Sarah. I'm um, in a webinar. Um, excuse me, everyone there. Uh, the um, On our CEO report template, Stephen, I'm considering adding a box there to put just in, in bullet point format our big four strategic pillars with the traffic light against them. What do you mm -hmm. think about that idea? Yeah, I think it's a great idea. And then if, if, you, if you then have, it has to have supporting information somewhere, though but not necessarily in that report. So you can give you an idea. I, I've got a CEO's report literally sitting in front of me at the moment where they do uh, essentially that very thing, traffic light reports, and, and those traffic light reports say um, issue that needs to be discussed on track or emerging issues, something along those lines. And then, and then there's you know, further on in the, in the, um, in the board papers, there, there's a discussion paper on each one of those that have emerging issues or have, uh, you know, where we're falling behind and it's a real issue that we need to talk about. So um, the notion of dashboard reports, for example, comes into this. I've seen many, many dashboard reports and many of them are very beautiful, but they also leave me wondering, what do you want me to do with this? So what? What are the implications of this? So when you're looking at reporting, particularly against um, your finances and particularly against any sort of dashboard reports, wisdom that what's the insights that we're getting from this what is this distilled wisdom that we're pulling out from this that is worthy of our time and discussion as a board rather than are we on track or not on track megan uh yes yeah, Stephen. i think that's i mean absolutely right couldn't agree with you more i'll take risk reporting for example you know you often see risk reports in board packs and they you know they you know they're they can sometimes be very complicated, but even if you only have a risk matrix that's tracking your, your top 20 risk, you know, 10 strategic, 10 operational, which I like to see. You know, I don't want all of the cascading risk of every department. I expect that framework to be in place and I'm overseeing the framework as a director, but as a director, I'm looking for, you know, the, the kind of top 10 operational, top 10 strategic risks. But even then, what I'm actually looking for is what is the trend is it outside appetite? So, you know, don't just tell me the colour coding. Tell me what's changed since last time. Classic example, once again, of reporting and the difference between reporting on activity as opposed to reporting on progress. Now, it is important to be reporting on progress because remember that the board's role is about strategy, but it's also about accountability for execution. So reporting on progress is very important. Keep in mind when you're reporting that you're not saying, where we're up to, it's where have we got to since the last board meeting? What have we done since then? And what's the next sprint looking like? So what can you expect and hold us accountable to at the next board meeting after this one? So that is the accountability role of boards, and that is important. 
And I think if you add to that any emerging issues that we've become aware of from this and what are the implications for us going forward, it means that your senior executives who are writing the reports are, are thinking not just about the activity, but they're thinking about what it all means. You know, it's, right. it's, it's taking that longer term view and giving a heads up to the board so that if we need guidance, it's not just guidance on what we do tomorrow, it's guidance about where we're heading in the next two to three years. And yeah. it's just it's just a way of thinking. It's a way of looking at how you actually um, put your report together. We have a couple of questions come in, Steve. I'll just uh, read them out if you don't mind. Uh, first one's from Lucas. Some members of my board want to be advised of every tiny detail. How do I develop the trust that they are getting the level of detail they need and that they will get more detail if they need it? Tommy? You tell them exactly that. Um, the, the, the two things always that I do um, when faced with that situation, I say, well, what's the strategic issue that you'd like behind this detail to see if I can tease out from them if there's a bigger issue that they, they're interested in? And then giving them access to some more of the detail without taking up the time of the board in that. And then asking them, did they get greater awareness from reading that detail that, that mm. they could share with me so that we can then add that into the board because it would be useful? I know some people really like going through the detail because that's who they are. They really enjoy it. They, they like going through it. And you can't, you shouldn't deny it to them. But at the same time, for those who aren't detail orientated, we need to keep them focused as well as the detail orientated people focused. So you know, give them access to that through either a link or through the, uh, I think, Megan, you called it the resource, the resource um, yeah. component of the board pack. Yep, there will usually be some sort of recent resource centre in, in board portals and you can, you know, where you, you keep your delegated authorities policy and your policies and procedures and whatnot, but, and it could be a SharePoint repository. So, uh, you know, however you communicate with your board, there's usually somewhere where you can stick it, where you can stick a link in. If, I if think you're... I just nailed it there, Stephen. And this is one of the things that I teach my executive because executive often get frustrated in board meetings and CEOs can get frustrated too, don't get me wrong. I've, I've been frustrated in the past as well. But it's a technique that I've learned and it's one where it's really useful to sit on both sides of the table to be a director as well as be a CEO because you, you, you wear the two different hats and you understand how those two different perspectives are influencing your behaviours. Mm -hmm. The thing that I teach my executive is to um, listen carefully and look for what is the question behind the question. That's Directors it. are taught to ask questions, but usually the question is not what they're actually wanting to know. What they're looking for is the underpinning strategic or risk concern that you've got or, or what is going on. So I will often say when you're asking that question about the uh you know the whatever the depreciation schedule i what are you worried about this and i'll try and understand what is the question and i will work in the meeting to draw that out from them because often it's not a question of detail unless they don't have confidence in your numbers so so for example they might ask you because it's a gotcha moment that's a different question though that's a conversation that you've got to have a with your team about getting your reporting more accurate so you're not having those gotcha moments but also it's a question to have a conversation to have with the board the chair about where is the confidence where, where is the confidence um, pact that you have to have between board and executive where is that falling down? Because if there's an existential threat of confidence, of lack of confidence in the executive's ability to deliver and that's where the questions are coming from, then that is a problem that you have to deal with as a confidence problem, not a con not an, a question that you have to deal with by just shoving more detail in board packs. And I think a lot of the un the unsaid stuff in, in some of those questions about more detail is to this day still we find many directors don't actually necessarily understand the business they're in either. Yeah. And that's another and that's another big issue. And so when you're looking at induction programs, please um, give them a really solid induction over 12 months into the business of the sector that you're in, because not everyone has that. And it tends to be the more detailed people, may, it may be because they, they just aren't familiar with the, the, the TAFE sector, the tertiary and further education sector. They're, they're not familiar with the aged care, whatever it might be. So help them 
understand the business, but don't try and do it at board meetings. Uh, we have a question from Suzanne. Suzanne, you had something? You had your hand raised, Suzanne. No? Just saying hi. Just saying hi. <laughs> Very good. Uh, here's, okay. from, here's a quick comment from Lara. Um, what if we are trending well financially and progressing well against the strategy? Will you have that in the report? We're a small charity. Absolutely. Yeah, keep them, keep them posted. But it would probably be a paper for information unless there's something that's worthy of board discussion. And one of the, one of the tricks always is that if you're travelling really well, that also should be discussed. We're traveling really well. What happens if we are actually growing faster than what we thought we are? Because it looks like we're, we're doing that. That's our biggest risk. So an emerging issue is, are we able to actually deal with that? That's a different conversation than just saying we're tracking well. Or, or the conversation soon might be, have we been ambitious enough? Yeah. In our strategy. Yeah, no, very true. We've seen some, uh, some uh, executive teams where they've, laid out a budget which was uh, pretty yeah pretty easy to get budget um well we're not growing for the sake of growing we're growing to increase the influence and this and the impact that we have on our stakeholders so what is that going to look like yeah or, or it may be are you investing enough for the future uh, you exactly. know are you making the right capital investments are you making the right human resource investments for the next iterative stage of your strategy all sorts of strategic questions come out. And of these are the questions really you can well. put in. These are the questions you can put in your reports. You don't have to answer them, but as the report writer, one of the things I've always found ex exceptionally useful is to have something that says something like "strategic questions for board consideration," so that we can actually start to, you know, ask, you know, how are our stakeholders going to see this? Uh, are we putting enough money into our capital expenditure? Uh, I, I don't have the answer, but it's worth having a look at. Much yes. more interesting conversations around there. Yes, okay, now other, other things, um, Megan's already covered the risk side of things, but really what I'm looking for from my risk reports is not just the, the, the pretty risk register, but I want to know as a director, our top four, five, six key risks, how well we're leveraging those risks not just whether or not they're being managed, but I want to know how we're turning them into opportunities, how we're leveraging them, how they can potentially create us revenue in ways that we hadn't thought of. That's what I want to spend my time looking at as a director, not just saying, oh, yes, we're managing those risks. Well, you're not managing the risk if you're not actually leveraging them as well. So anyway, next slide. Uh, CEO's report we've talked a little bit about here. Look, the key thing with, with the CEO's report, there's two elements in there. Um, one of them is um, it's a great way of actually introducing emerging issues. What, you know, what's keeping me awake at night time? What are some of the emerging issues? Megan's already said here are some of the upcoming papers you'll get. This is what's, you know, what's entertaining us and, and our intellect over the next I'm just giving you a bit of a, a heads up on that one. But also a... Um, if there's anything in your CEO's report that you want the board to discuss, pull it out as a separate discussion paper. If there's something in there that is worthy of board insight and board discussion, don't just have it on now on page 13 of my CEO's report. I'd like you to discuss X, Y, and Z. Pull it out as a separate discussion paper so they can go through, they can read the CEO's report. You've highlighted emerging issues. You've highlighted an upcoming discussion that you'd like the board to have in those areas. They can always say that we'd like to talk about X, Y, and Z, but they should probably talk to the chair about that prior to the board meeting rather than bringing it up at the board meeting. Okay. A couple of uh, questions yeah. come in. Sorry, Megan, just a couple of questions I want to throw into the mix there. Go for it. Uh, Jane said, uh, what do you see as the main reason the reports are poor or late? Is it usually because the paid leaders don't get a board mindset or don't want to put in the work um, like in small nonprofits? I, um, I was actually going to jump in because I'd saw, saying that question come through and, and that was what I actually wanted to address. Oh, um, great. You know, it's a classic example. I used to... Uh, run the industry association for the engineering sector and uh, you get wonderful uh, engineers who are brilliant technicians and and can design the best 
roads and railways and bridges and and buildings um, that that you can get. And of course, they're so good at their technical job that they get promoted into management and all of a sudden they're managing people and, and teams and stakeholders. Are they given HR training? Are they given stakeholder relationship training? Usually, no. It's sort of supposedly that they've learned by osmosis during their career and all of a sudden, expert in area A is supposed to be expert in area B. I would just say that a lot of managers now have this new role that they have to play in that they have to do this thing called reporting to the board. you got to teach them how to do it. You can't just expect them to understand and know. There are courses. The Governance Institute's got a huge range of courses. We were talking about them earlier. Very popular on how to write board papers, how to write minutes, how to write AGM papers. You know, these are a skill set and you've got to you got to teach someone. So um, put someone on governance training. A lot of people get into these decision-making executive positions. What they don't appreciate is that their fundamental role has changed. They might not be the IT doer anymore. They might not be the finance doer anymore. Now they're a manager and reporter and they're a governance professional. Send them on some governance training. Mm. Yeah, I'd add to that um, that it's actually a real art to, to do it really well and it takes years of learning. So I never do a report without having somebody sort of co-pilot me or support me. I often use the the CFO, even when I feel like I've nailed it, um, just having another set of eyes before the board meeting, you know, who knows the board members can sometimes give you critical critical feedback and input. What some boards have done to help change the culture of the report writing is that the chair has taken it on themselves to, spend, to get the board papers uh, a day before the due to go out to the board and they read every single one of the board papers, skimming it, looking at does it answer the so what question and, it, does, it tell him, and it, does it tell me where Wally is? Does it tell me where the big thing is that I need to be focusing on? And if it doesn't, I send it back to the board, uh, to the report writer, like Megan said with her seniors, um, you send it back to them so that they can actually have a bit more um, uh, focus on it. That only has to happen for a few months and they get the idea after that. So I know one one chair in particular who said, this is a six-month program I embarked on and literally I was sending back about 40% of the reports with a day that they could, uh, the day before they were due to go out so they could get it more clearly focused. After about four months, I didn't have to do it anymore. That coaching role is really important, Steve. Um, I do that for my executive. If you've got the luxury of having an external co-sec and, you know, there's some great co-secs, and including those that will provide services pro bono and a co-sec can play that coaching role, but I do it personally. So my executive get the, um, you know, my board papers go out a week before the board meeting. Mm. I get them the week before that. I personally review every single paper and I do that for three reasons. First of all, I've got to read them anyway. I, I can't sit in a board meeting as a CEO and not know what's in the papers. So I might as well read them two weeks out as opposed to one week out. doesn't make any difference. The second reason is it's a wonderful coaching opportunity. You know, the old adage, you don't give a man a fish, you teach a man to fish. I would use that as an opportunity to go back with each of my executive and talk to them and coach them. It's part of their ongoing coaching mechanism. And it might be about their ability to think strategically or their ability to write in such a format. Uh, it, so it could be on a whole range of things, but giving them that opportunity. And the third reason, of course, is because if the board pack is pretty ordinary, guess who the buck stops with? Stops with oh, the yeah. I'm responsible at the end of the day. They're not going to look through that and go, oh, you know, Executive A is, you know, wrote a terrible paper. It's my job to make sure that they're, the board are getting the level of confidence that they need to not ask for more detail by getting a professional pack. That's on me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is there one more slide there, Sean, before we finish up? Okay. So what we've got in there is for if, something for you that might be useful. It's a it's a project plan. This is a real li live example of a project plan of how you can take your board reporting and move it up to the next level and just literally work your way through some of those ideas that are in there. And then you can develop up a time frame around it and who's in charge of doing it. It's a very simple technique, but I've, I very seldom see it being used. So um, Board Pro have uh, agreed to provide this as a template for you to take away and you can work with your executive team to go through all of that. 
So let's finish up there. Um, we wanted to talk about how late reporting can kill the CEO. <laughs> and there's the two types. One of them is the annoying one, which is just reports that are late. And the other one is the more existential, where we just miss the stuff that should be reported on and that we should be actually helping to focus our board's attention on. So, Sean, over to you. Thanks, Steve. Um, so please, everyone, feel free to reach out to Megan, Stephen uh, or Brett on LinkedIn. Uh, there'll also be a quick uh, survey at the end, as I said in the opening, uh, for you to indicate whether you'd like to be put in contact with either of the team members. Uh, that is the end of our uh, session. I hope to see you back over the next uh, couple of three weeks for our other webinars. Uh, and as I mentioned in the introduction, you'll receive an email from us shor uh, shortly, which will have all of the resources that we talked about in the session today. Now, just as you leave, don't forget to uh, complete our one-minute survey, go in the draw to win our, win our beautiful hamper, and we'll announce the winner for that uh, over the next 24 hours. So thanks again, everybody, for your attendance. Thank you, Brett, Stephen, and Megan for your time and knowledge today. We'll see you at the next webinar.